This video is a ministry of Chesapeake Church, located in Huntingtown, Maryland. We thank you for watching and hope that this helps you grow into a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. worship together.
that never run dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come, all you sinners, come find His mercy. Come to the table, He will satisfy. Taste of His goodness, find what you're looking for. problems, all of our issues, everything. We bring it to your feet this morning. And we thank you for your son that you brought to this world to save us. We love you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. Well, good morning. My name's Adam and I want to welcome you to Chesapeake. When you came in this morning, our welcome team handed you one of these. It's a connect card. It has just a few opportunities on it that we'd like to highlight. Uh, but if you look at the bottom, there's a QR code. You can scan it. It'll take you to a digital version that has even more information. And the beauty of this thing is you can even use the back to take notes during today's message. If this is your first Sunday with us. First of all, welcome. And we'd love for you to do something for us. Please fill out a let us know card. It lets us know what you would like to know more about at Chesapeake. 
You can, do, you can do that by just scanning that QR code right here. You see, at Chesapeake, we believe that involvement is connection. As you participate in an event or as you serve in one of our ministries, you're naturally just gonna meet new people and begin to build relationships. And guess what? That's our goal here. The place to learn more about that is at the link. It's at the back auditorium doors on the right. You're gonna see some folks that would love to meet you and get to know you and answer any questions that you have. You can also visit the link online by looking at our website or on our Chesapeake Church app. If you don't already have our app, now's a great time to download it. Just fire up the app store, go right ahead. Uh, on there, you're gonna find different resources to help you stay connected and to grow in your faith. Later in the service, we're gonna be celebrating communion together. And if this is your first time celebrating communion with us, again, you can scan that QR code and it'll tell you more information about what we believe the Bible teaches about communion. As we move into the offering this morning, please don't feel any pressure to give. We are just so glad that you're here. But if you do feel moved to give, we thank you and we know that your gift will truly build God's kingdom here. Offering is just our opportunity to continue to worship God by just returning just a portion of all that he has blessed us with. Which is why we say the church doesn't take an offering, but the people make an offering. You can give right on our Chesapeake Church app just by tapping the give button on the bottom right hand corner there, or you can drop your offering in the bag as it comes by. And as we continue to worship this morning, we read just a small piece of Psalm 18. I encourage you to go back and read the whole thing. It's fantastic. David just so beautifully describes how amazing our God is. And we get the joy of worshiping a God who brings light into our world of darkness. He guides our steps. He gives us strength and encouragement to keep going, even in the midst of tough times. He's so good to us, and we worship him this morning. Please pray with me. Dear Lord God, thank you so much for all that you do for us. You are an amazing, incredible God. God, you, you bring light to us, you, you guide our steps, you direct our path. God, we just thank you so much for that. We worship you, we praise you. Uh, God, we just pray for this offering. We pray that you would use it to build your kingdom here. Uh, we love you, it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here, turn lives around. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. for all you do. We love you so. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Andy. I'm one of the pastors here at Chesapeake. And it's been a minute since I was in this spot, which I'm not complaining about. Um, But the last time that I was here, I did let you guys know that my teenage daughter um, is part of an illustration, just um, sharing that she didn't quite fit into my clothes yet, but she really wasn't interested in wearing them anyway. Something about style differences. And so I feel obligated to let you know this morning that she does now fit into my clothes and she is borrowing them. (laughs) 
Um, she is also apparently now taller than me, but that's not something I'm willing to admit yet. So I will say for those of you with younger kids who might be staring down the teen years with fear, it is way more fun than I expected. Um, and I know that we as parents feel like we are teaching our kids, but we also know that they teach us a lot too, right? So I've been busy learning all sorts of new words by listening to her and her friends, um, <laughs> or just new ways to use words that I thought I already knew what they meant. So like when I bring her friends home from shopping and I hear one of them say, check out my new drip. I can't even say that with a straight face. <laughs> um, it took me a minute to realize that what she meant was what normal people, or at least old people, call a necklace. <laughs> um, but when we were discussing a summer challenge that they had found online where you earn points for things that you do over the summer and you compete with your friends to see who can win, um, you can also lose points. And so I was informed that one would lose points for simping. There was not enough context for me to figure that one out, so I had to Google it. Um, and I was told after first service that maybe it's less appropriate than I thought it was, um, but a, what I pulled up on Google for me, I wasn't afraid to say on stage, so. Um, but the point is that this is actually the same way that I study scripture. Not by listening to teenagers talk about it, though it's not a terrible idea, um, but by looking at words that I think I know the meaning of and determining whether that's actually the way the original writer intended them to be understood. Or by just going ahead and looking up things that I know right away I don't understand. And I do that in order for me to figure out how to apply this ancient writing to my modern life, and also how to talk about it with teenagers. So that's what we're going to do this morning as we look at Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. Maybe discover a new way to look at some familiar concepts. Sound good? Okay, don't get too excited, guys. <laughs> I already did the work for you. I've done the looking up. We're just going to talk about it. Um, but before we get into that passage, I want to do a quick recap of the letter up to this point. If you missed any of the previous messages in this series, I still encourage you to go catch up on those. This is just going to be a really quick overview of the text. But I think it's important because what we're looking at this morning is a prayer. But Paul didn't start the prayer in our passage for today. The way I read it, he actually started it all the way back in chapter 1. He's just sidetracked a few times to explain some things to us. So if we back up all the way to chapter 1, verse 1, he opens up with an introduction and a greeting, but then in verse 3, he's flowing immediately into praise for God, for who he is and what he's done for us. And he's going to get into more detail on that in chapter 2, but here he's setting the stage for why he is so on fire for the people who belong to the church to understand the implications of God's love for them. He gets it as much as any human can. And so because of the massive impact that God's love has had on his heart and his life, he desperately wants others to get it too. So in verses 4 through 14, he paints this rich picture of God's immense love and power and the work he's done on behalf of the people he's called to be his children, which includes us, right? And he says that this is the reason that he gives thanks for them as he remembers them in his prayers. So to paraphrase his reason, he's saying, because I understand that each of you have been adopted by the God of the universe in the same way that I have, that we are both chosen and set apart, that we have been redeemed from the life we lived before we encountered Jesus, and that he has chosen to reveal his will to us and to seal us with his Holy Spirit. For that reason, because of our unity in the purpose and privilege we've been given to glorify God, I pray, verses 17 through 19, that God would give you a greater understanding of who he is to us, what he has done for us through his grace, and how much power he's willing to work through us. He's like, I know. And I know that when you know, you'll know. I'm just not convinced that you really know yet. 
And so he takes a moment to specify the power that he's referring to. This is the resurrection power that brought Jesus back to life and set him up as the single authority over everything in heaven and on earth and established him as the leader of the church. The church who would then come to represent everything that he is to the world around us. So I think that's worthy of sidetracking to point out, right? But then before he can get back to the prayer, he wants the people of this church to understand just how much it means to be part of the church. And so we have chapter 2. And Paul spends the segment that we call chapter 2 reminding the church of where we all were before Jesus, spiritually dead, with no hope of bringing ourselves to life. And so how gracious God was to overlook our rebellious hearts and gift us true life in spite of ourselves. And he ends up highlighting that the reality that this non-Jewish church was actually like dead, dead. Like the Jews at least knew they needed a savior. But y'all, and I'm assuming most of us, were operating completely independent of God. And so he wants them to know And I want you to know that maybe you feel or you've been made to feel inferior or like you're not good enough because of where you came from, because you weren't always an insider. But I'm here to tell you that you have the exact same access to the exact same hope and peace and power as the OGs. We're all one big family now. And so as we move into chapter 3, Paul's about to get back to the prayer, but first he reminds us again that even though the Jews didn't know it was going to happen this way, God has revealed that anyone who places their faith in the saving work of Jesus is a partner in the promise through the gospel. I love that phrase. And Paul is so passionate about the unity of the church about breaking down cultural barriers and extending the good news of the gospel to all walks of life, making sure it's clear that there is no division in God's kingdom. It is all and only about how we respond to Jesus. So once we understand who we were without God, who Jesus is to us, and what he's done on our behalf, the unearned access that he's given us to his kingdom... We have the full perspective from which Paul is praying for this church. And friends, I want you to know that this prayer is prayed by every church leader who gets the gospel over the church that they lead. So this prayer is every bit as much for you as it was for the Ephesians. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in the inner man through his spirit, and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height, and depth of God's love, and to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge, so you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's quite the prayer. But what does it mean, really? Like, it's poetic, But how does it apply to us in Calvert County, Maryland in 2023? I mean, I like the idea of being granted something out of the riches of God's glory and being strengthened with power. I've watched a lot of superhero movies, so that sounds pretty awesome. But does it mean what it sounds like at first? Let's take a look. You guys ready to walk it out? Okay. (laughs) All right, so first, Paul opens the prayer with one more explanation, because it's Paul. And so he says that he kneels before the Father. But who is the Father? He says the Father is the one from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. But we could read that as the one after whom the whole family is named. So he points this out because he's hearkening back to this theme of unity. He wants to make sure we really get it. And Paul had first introduced the concept of family in chapter 1, where he invoked the model of adoption. And I know I've taught on this before, but just a quick summary in case you weren't here or you don't remember. In their context, the concept of adoption would have brought about the imagery not of a young child finding a home to grow up in, but of someone already grown who's giving up their former identity in order to become a representative for a new family. 
So they would become the heir to that father's inheritance and the one who carries forward not only the family name, but also the values and the reputation of that family. So taking on the name of a father means that we are called to carry his character and his values to the world around us, that we represent him in everything that we do. So essentially, Paul's reminding us that every single person who's been adopted into God's family, regardless of where they came from, regardless of how much Jewish scripture they knew beforehand, has the same right and responsibility to represent God to the rest of the world. It's not about our earthly name. It's not about the parents we were born to or the life we lived before we met Jesus. It's about the name that was placed on us through adoption by our Heavenly Father. That unifies us as one family across all space and time with one Father and one calling to love God with everything that we have and to love each other the way we love ourselves, which is how Jesus said that the world would know that we were his disciples, right? By the way we love each other. But if, as Patrick said last week, it's not about behavior modification or just trying my best, then how do we come to do that in a way that truly brings glory to God? Well, that's exactly what's being prayed over us, that we would be strengthened with power in our inner being, that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we would comprehend the totality and vastness of God's love and be filled with all his fullness. That's how we take hold of all that God has for us. Maybe not quite the effort on our part that we think about when we imagine fulfilling God's call on our lives and living out his will, right? It sounds a lot more like God working in us than us working for God, doesn't it? So there are three main things there for us to break down together. First, to be strengthened with power. That's the first action phrase in that prayer, right? So he's asking that God would increase our strength with power. And this word for power has the same roots as our words for dynamite and dynamic. So the implication is that this is forceful and multifaceted. This is not just any power. This is explosive, miraculous power. One of the primary definitions I came across was moral power and excellence of soul, which sounds pretty spot on with everything else that Paul's written, but also because he specifies that this is in our inner being. And that same Greek word for power can carry the connotation of power arising from numbers or consisting in armies or forces which we can also see because he specifies that this comes through the Holy Spirit. So this is not something that we work up or create on our own in order to accomplish tasks in this life. This power that's being prayed over us is for the moral excellence of our soul, and it comes from the Holy Spirit as if by an army. That's quite the visual. But what is that strength for? Because the strength of the world looks very different from the strength of God's kingdom. The strength of the world is in doing. It's in chasing our dreams, accomplishing goals that we've set, building our own kingdoms, pursuing our own pleasure. But the strength of the spirit is in being. It's the power to put away the desires of the world. When we're strong in the spirit, we exhibit peace and patience and kindness and self-control. Not because we tried harder, but because we surrendered more and we made more room for the Holy Spirit to rush in and fill that space with his presence, which is peace and gentleness and wisdom. Second, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So he's clarifying again, this is not something that we work to accomplish. Christ dwells in our hearts through faith and faith alone. We cannot earn his presence. He did the work to get there, 
We are just trusting in it. So what does it mean to dwell in a heart? That sounds kind of weird, right? Well, Pastor Larry taught us a few weeks ago about the ancient understanding of the heart. So if we take that and we apply it here, then this is that Jesus would be at home in our innermost being. To dwell is to be always present, to pervade or govern a space. So this is not just about him taking up a tiny corner that we want to give him to feel like we secured our salvation without disrupting our lives here on earth too much. This is about him being comfortable and it being his residence. It's the core of who we are, belonging to Jesus to direct. And then third, that we may be able to comprehend God's love. So this is where Paul tells us that he wants us to know what's beyond knowing. Like, that doesn't really make sense, dude. (laughs) But really, if you know, you know. If you ask any believer with a strong, active faith journey to explain to you the depth of that relationship, they will almost certainly tell you that they can't. That yes, there are some things that they can put into words and explain, but there are other things that you can't explain in human understanding. You just have to experience them. And that depth, that knowing what's beyond knowing, comes through the next phrase I want to look at together. So you thought you were getting out early because we moved through those three points real fast, but we have a few minutes left, and this is my favorite part. So before he ever tells them the third thing that he's praying for, Paul gives a precursor. He says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may be able to comprehend. So the assumption here is that it takes being rooted and established in love in order to know what's beyond knowing. At least for me, that phrase, rooted and established, brings to mind trees. Now, I'm not an arborist, and my husband will tell you that yard work is not even anywhere on my priority list. So I don't speak with a ton of expertise on this, but I think it's pretty safe to say that an established tree serves a purpose. It's established trees that provide the best shade. It's established trees that produce fruit. So to be established is to be beneficial to those around you. When we are established in God's love, we're able to offer rest and spiritual nourishment to the people he surrounded us with. That is how we display God's love to the world. It's really by being a conduit or an extension of his presence. And the more of his presence that we hold, the more we have to offer those around us. So that begs the question, how do we get more of his presence? Or as Paul calls it, his fullness. Well, in order to become established, we have to first be rooted. And one of the few things that I know about roots is that they need water. So when I was a little girl, I remember hearing a story um, about a family who had a weeping willow tree in their yard when a drought settled in the area. And apparently, weeping willows require a lot of water. And so since this tree wasn't getting enough, it actually ended up seeking out with its roots one of their home water lines in order to take what it needed to continue thriving. And I love thinking of that visual when we consider that Jesus described himself as living water. And then Paul uses this analogy of roots to talk about the strength of our relationship with God. So the question we have to ask ourselves is how hard are we willing to seek out deeper roots in Christ's love? We will get up earlier or stay up later or make time on our lunch break to go to the gym, to get ahead at work, to study for a test. Are we willing to put that same energy and effort into deepening our relationship with God? Are we willing to find water that might not seem easily available in order to strengthen our roots. Because Jesus' guidance to us was to seek first his kingdom, and he would take care of all of the rest of it, all of those other things that tend to get our first and best energy. So if you're a note taker, consider jotting down this question. What does it look like for me to seek his kingdom first in this season of my life? Because as much as I love that you're here right now and engaging in Sunday morning gatherings is an important piece of your faith journey, 
that alone will not grant you deep roots. Our family lives in North Beach, and there have been several times when we have seen massive trees just blow over in a storm. And I understand that there's probably a lot of factors at play, but the short of what I see is that they had shallow roots. They were surviving off of surface water. We live six blocks off the bay and up a hill, and still our yard is almost always wet. There's no need to dig deep. But friends, if we don't deepen our roots, we can look like we've got it all together for a time, but the right storm will blow us over. So regardless of what comes easily, regardless of how good we might look staying on the surface, let's be a church who's willing to seek after the deeper things of God so we can stand firm through any storm. Paul wraps up these three requests by saying that the point of knowing God's love is so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, the complete fullness of God is not something we could ever handle in this life. So if you're a believer this morning, you're like, well, I feel like I might be a little bit lacking in the complete fullness of God. You're right. It's okay. (laughs) Paul understood that this whole thing is a continuous process we engage in, not by trying harder but by surrendering more and more of ourselves to make room for more and more of his presence in us. And the surest way I know to do that is by continuously discovering more of who God is. Because if there's one thing I've learned about God, it's that there will always be something more to learn about him. And the more we get to know him, the more we want to surrender our will and our ways for more of his will and his ways. As we close out chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 tell us that the ultimate purpose in all of this is that he would be glorified. So at some point, we have to come to the realization that anything worth doing in light of eternity happens through his strength. If we can do it through our own strength, then the result becomes our own glory. And seeking our own glory is really trying to put ourselves above God. This can be hard to reconcile at first, but I really believe the more we get to know him, the more worthy we find him of all of the glory. And the more we recognize that we don't actually have to work harder in order to glorify him more. We just have to surrender more of ourselves for more of him to be on display, which I know feels just as hard sometimes. (laughs) But the more we get to know him, the easier it becomes. We learn through experience that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways. And yet he allows us to be in partnership with him. We get the opportunity to let go of our human nature and take on his supernatural power. Mere mortals who get to represent the God of the universe to the world around us, bringing light into darkness. Friends, the church, when it is rooted and established in God's love, becomes a supernatural force that the world will stand in awe of because it is above and beyond anything that human minds could think up or imagine on our own. And the great news is that we don't have to try to figure out how to change the world. God has chosen to work through people. And so it's the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us that fuels the changes that make room for more of him so that we can more authentically represent God to the world around us. But then we do that primarily by loving one another, which is not maybe the first thing that comes to mind when we think about doing the work of being the church. And we know we need some Holy Spirit presence to do that sometimes, right? (laughs) But that is the real strength. That's the real sign and wonder that will leave the world in awe, is how the church loves each other. It's the strength to surrender and then pour out more of his love. So maybe this morning you're here and you haven't surrendered your life to God. And to be honest, surrendering who you are and then giving away the glory for anything that happens in your life doesn't really sound like something you'd be into. 
And all I can tell you is that I get that. But if you were to get an accurate picture of who God is, then it will make total sense to you. Because once you know, you just know. And so this morning as we move into communion, if you don't know yet, just let the elements pass by you. And then ask God to reveal himself to you this week. And if you do know, I want to encourage you to take this time to reflect on who he is to you and ask him what it is that he might be asking you to surrender more of. How can you make more room for him? How can you strengthen your roots? Where might he want to invite you to be a greater part of extending his love to those around you? To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Well, good morning, Chesapeake. I'm John Miller, uh, one of the elders here, and uh, really is a privilege for me to lead in communion this morning. Um, as Andy spoke of surrender just now, I don't know about you, but for me, uh, that word, um, I don't like that word just thinking about it first glance. Um, you know, I, it makes me kind of think of a losing team or maybe a, a side in war that's totally lost. They've completely given up, given up their rights, given up total control. And then as I thought about it more, as I was preparing for this, I realized this is exactly what Christ has done for you and done for me. 1 John 3.16 says that Jesus laid down his life. He surrendered his life. He was not forced. He was not backed into a corner. It was something that he willingly did. Jesus took bread and said, this is my body, broken for you for the remission of sin. And they passed the bread, and when all had been served, together they ate. When Jesus willingly surrendered his life, he was and is and will always be King, Lord, Creator, Sustainer of all that there is. And a God this big, this immense, and yet he still gets so incredibly personal. Then in 1 Corinthians 5, it says that he who knew no sin became sin himself so that he could take on the full wrath of God, the full punishment for our sins. He took them in our place. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. And together they ate. Then Jesus took a cup and said, this is the cup of my blood, which will be spilled out for the forgiveness of sin. As opposed to me encouraging you this morning and saying, now let's try really hard to surrender. I want you and I to focus our gaze on the cross, the place that encapsulates the breath the length, the height, and the depths of God's love for you. And have your heart so moved by the Holy Spirit as you see Jesus willingly 
surrendered all. He not only took the ultimate loss, he became the ultimate loss. He became your and my ultimate loss. He lost his life. He lost everything so that we could in turn have the sweetest, most amazing surrender of all. And they passed the cup, and when all had been served, together they drank. There is so much in this life that's pulling at me, pulling at you, wanting something from me, demanding things of me. In essence, the question is not if I will surrender, it's to whom or to what I will surrender my life to. What will I give ultimate authority to in my life? Here's a suggestion. Why don't we give up our control, our rights, why don't we surrender to the one who has surrendered his life for ours? Jesus has taken all of the negative aspects of surrender on himself so that his power can be unleashed in us when we surrender to him. And that's an adventure, that's a ride that I want to be on. I don't know about you. To the degree that you and I believe that Jesus surrendered his life for us completely, personally, to that degree, we will be able to live a life surrendered to him. This is my blood, Jesus said, poured out for the forgiveness of sins, and together they drank. Now, just as a reminder, as we talk about surrender, maybe God has put something on your heart that you want prayer for, some help from the Holy Spirit to help surrender. The prayer team will be up here afterwards, so please feel free to be comfortable to do that afterwards. Um, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we do thank you. Lord, we thank you for the beauty we thank you for the unfathomable grace that you give us. Lord, it is something that someone who never has heard of you needs to hear so badly. And it is something who's been following you, someone who's been following you their whole lives needs to hear desperately. Lord, we try to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps way too much, Lord. We need your spirit to give us life and breath and motivation to give you everything. We pray for that kind of faith in each and every person in this room this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Man, it is incredible to think how God has made his plans for us so clear. I mean, how he wants to guide us, guide our lives and call us into his greater purpose, not only for our own lives, but also for our church. So let's walk out this morning with a passion to bring people into those plans. But before we do, 
we have a couple great opportunities for you. First up, to our teens. Our July summer chills are coming up next week on July 18th and 19th. Now, if you're sitting there and you're like, man, what the heck is a summer chill? It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a, just a place to hang out with friends, to meet some of our leaders in a low key, relaxed environment. So high schoolers, you're invited to my house for a pool party. Uh, we're gonna have snacks and yard games and we're gonna bring back the ever popular paddle boarding on the Patuxent. Uh, so bring your bathing suit, a towel and some sunscreen. And middle schoolers, you're gonna have a night of water games right here on campus on the 19th. Uh, we're planning splash kickball and we'll have water balloons. Uh, it's gonna, and of course we're gonna have snacks, right? You can't have a youth event without snacks, right? Uh, and it's gonna be a blast. Look, as the youth director here, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have your teen stay connected throughout the summer. Throughout the summer by coming to these events. So if you can't make this one, don't worry, we're gonna have another one coming up in August. You can follow us on Instagram, just at Peak Youth for all the details. Another great opportunity to cool off this summer is our family splash party. Uh, it's gonna be at Summit Park. It's gonna be a great event no matter how old you are. Uh, there's gonna be kiddie pools and bubbles for the little guys, uh, and we'll have water gun fights and water balloon capture the flag. I mean, that sounds awesome uh, for our teens. And then we'll have a cookout and with burgers and hot dogs and Rita's. Um, and it's just gonna be a great time. All we ask for is that you just RSVP ahead of time, uh, just that way we know uh, what side you're gonna bring and then also how old your kids are. I mean, the last thing we want is everyone to bring like 30 different pasta salads, right? And you know, even if it is your secret family recipe. <laughs> uh, look, so when you came in this morning, you received one of these. Now this card actually has a double purpose. So first off, if you look, turn on the back, it has a QR code, we love these things. Uh, you can uh, scan it and RSVP to the event. Uh, but then also, you can also, once you RSVP, you can pass this on to a friend or a family member. We would love to have them come as well. And parents, man, this is our opportunity to just enjoy a cookout, enjoy each other's company, meet other parents, uh, have our kids stop nagging us for about five minutes while they're playing with other kids, right? It's gonna be a great time. Uh, remember, there's always something going on here at Chesapeake and the link is the place for you to find out and get connected. So we hope to see you back next Sunday as we continue our, our Ephesians series with a message called Your Worthy Calling. Let everyone please stand up and we'll, we'll pray us, I'll pray us out. Dear God, I just thank you so much uh, just for your incredible, amazing love. God, that you love us so much uh, that you would die for us. You would pay the ultimate sacrifice for us. God, I just thank you so much. God, I pray that that never, ever goes dull on us. God, that we would always be mindful of what you've done for us. God, I pray for, uh, pray for us as we, as we go. I pray that, um, that you just bring, it back, bring us back next week um, and just help us throughout the week uh, to surrender to you. God, that's not something that we can do on our own. We need you to help us do that. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. about Chesapeake Church, visit us at chesapeakechurch.org or follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook.